Yeah, dear colleagues, good afternoon, and uh, dear guests as well, of course, good afternoon, welcome to the IER Forum, and I'm very happy to welcome Professor Julia Levinson, uh, as uh, she will talk about a key issue of interest, of course, both for us as an institute, but I think also for uh, developments in science more generally, uh, as we may come to discuss uh, towards the end. Um, yeah, Professor Leverton, she is uh, at the Bafana University. Currently, but I've seen you've already pointed out here your new position. Maybe you say a few words about that yeah, at the uh, Czech Academy of Science. Um, you have a very interdisciplinary or non or undisciplined background, which I, I very much uh, uh, <coughs> encourage also, as, as we know, in, in education, uh, coming from you study environmental sciences, international development, and then moved on towards sustainability sciences uh, in different places in Europe. Um, and uh, more recently, this is what you will talk about, you have led a big project uh, on a very interesting topic, which is the leverage points, uh, leverage points concept. Um, the meadow, meadows comes uh, to mind immediately, but you have taken a very interesting uh, approach there, so happy to hear about Nice. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you for having me and for the introduction. Um, yes, in my abstract uh, for coming here today, I mentioned about the Fridays for Future movement and Extinction Rebellion. Um, and I very purposefully have this picture up here. I've been quite active in supporting Fridays for Future through the Scientists for Future movement and we've been doing workshops working with the school students around Luneburg and I've been active in it, I've wanted to support them because of this emphasis on uh, system change, not climate change, the, the idea that we need to change systems to, to move towards sustainability. Um, and that's really the kind of work that I'm involved with at Lokana University. Um, and they give me hope. The conversations that they are having and the way that people are paying attention to them give me hope. And I'm going to tell you a little bit during this presentation. Hopefully it will become clear as to why I have hope because of the Fridays for Future movement. Why it's given me hope. Um, I think that it's important that the Fridays for Future movement and the Extinction Rebellion movements are really um, saying what we as scientists have been saying for a long time, but they're getting it out there. People are listening in a way that they haven't been listening to us. Um, so, what I'd like to do today is talk to you a little bit about how we build on this uh, momentum. So this push for systems change. Because what we do know, because we have been talking about this for a long time, is we have lots of ideas about what needs to change in the system. And we've got lots of, I think, creative and indeed brilliant ideas about how that system needs to look like, what the end goals of that system need to be. This move away from uh, late stage capitalism into different ways of doing things, different ways to structure our society. Um, I highly recommend all three of these books as ways of thinking about different ways of being. Um, and we've recently had a lot of talk in the press about things like the Green New Deal. Um, but how? So we have these endpoints, the places we're moving towards. How are we going to get there? And to me, that's a very important question, and what I'm going to be zooming in a little bit to today. Um, so these are my core messages. This slide will also be my conclusion slide at the end. Um, so if you miss parts during today's presentation, then I'm telling you now what you're going to be able to take away from it. Um, so this first, the first two points, engaging with individual values, and engaging with design and structures of systems and the values that are embedded within them. This is how we move from today's system to this end point. 
And this is why I get hopeful about movements like Fridays for Future, because they are engaging with what people are valuing and what people want to see embedded within the system. They're targeting individuals and they're starting to push for structural changes within our system. Um, but I'm going to move on a bit from that to say, okay, it's not just about targeting the values about the end point, what we want to see. We also need to think about the values about that people have around what that system needs to look like. Who needs to interact with whom? How do they do that? What values are those based upon? And I'm going to tell you a little bit that we need to pay more attention to the history, how people have constructed their values and beliefs about how we interact with each other, how we create these systems. Um, and I'm going to then highlight a couple of interesting areas that I want to take my own research in, following on from leverage points. Um, and I'm going to touch a little bit about how we do that, what I'm planning to do to add a connection and nuance to questions of values and structure, and what, what a good research uh, approach to doing that would be. <coughs> so, what the way I'm going to tell you about all these things today, I'm going to zoom in a little bit into the Leverage Points project. I'll tell you a little bit about who we were, what we were doing, where, when and how. I'm then going to uh, talk a little bit about what we mean when we talk about values and structures in the Leverage Points project. Um, I've just started talking to you today about values and structures, but what do I mean? Um, I will tell you more about that and tell you what we learned during this project. I'm going to give you examples and lessons that come directly from the research that we did in that project. And then moving into this point on the case of biodiversity in Europe, I'm going to start talking more about what I personally took from the project. And I'm going to combine it with a few other little bits of research that have been ongoing during this time to, to tell you yeah, what, what my thinkings about this are. And that will then lead into a reflection on research practices. So, let's get underway. Leverage points. Leverage points started because there were a number of us at Lofan University who were frustrated. We were frustrated and we used this um, metaphor of rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. The Titanic, the world is sinking, and instead of stopping it sinking, we're wondering about where we're going to sit. We're rearranging the deck chairs. Um, our frustration came out of previous research that we've been involved in. Um, I looked a lot at, say, policy systems, governance systems, that were fiddling around, providing incentives for people to change their behaviour, changing the amount of money that somebody got to uh, build a hedge on their agricultural land, for example. And it frustrated me because it was teach treating the symptoms of uh, what was going wrong in the system rather than treating the underlying causes. Um, as an example, when we started putting together the Leverage Points project, I just finished up a project that was um, based in sub-Saharan Africa looking at reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation. And so there was this push from the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change to find a funding mechanism to be able to compensate um, countries like Zambia and Malawi, where I was working, to compensate them to keep forest resources intact, so to not deforest, not get rid of forests to make agricultural land, to not sell off their forests for timber, for example. And instead, they would get payments for carbon storage. And so there was talk about setting up a, a global carbon market. And it drove me crazy. <laughs> I left that research project so demotivated because we were talking about setting up voluntary carbon markets that were paying people a pittance to manage a patch of forest land where they didn't have enough food. They didn't have basic energy requirements. And we were saying, oh, but please don't do forest because then you can have a euro, two euros. And even if we were doing that, they didn't have a bank to go and cash in the, the money for, <laughs> for keeping their patch of forest there. 
And so this payment just wasn't doing enough to uh, counter the real drivers of deforestation, the lack of energy security, the lack of food security. And actually we needed to be doing something far more fundamental to deal with these underlying drivers rather than to try and pay someone peanuts for resisting them. So instead of doing this, instead of talking about how much money do we pay someone, what does a market look like, I wanted to think more deeply, how do we change this system? And I was joined by my seven other colleagues in this frustration, and we put together the Leverage Point project. At this point, I would like to flag in particular Dave Abson, who also led this project with me. Um, he's important in this presentation because some of the better figures that you're about to see were actually made by Dave because he's much better at graphics than I am. So we started with the rationale, as Mark has mentioned, of Donella Meadows, places to intervene in a system. This was really our starting point. So Meadows, in her essay in 1999, argued that you can intervene in a system in a number of different leverage points. The analogy is really nice because she talks about shallow leverage points. So those that happen down here, they're easy to do. Uh, they're easy to define, very tangible things to do. But as we all know from the lever, if you press near the, the pivot point, the system is not going to move very far. The deeper leverage points up here are harder to do, they're less tangible, but if you press there, you're moving the system much further. And so we're talking about leverage points as being places to intervene in a system that bring about fundamental sustainability transformations. So not messing around the edges, not rearranging our deck chairs, but really addressing the underlying drivers of unsustainability. Mm -hmm. So in Meadows' essay, she talks about 12 leverage points, and we categorised them into four categories. We talked about material and processes as being two of these categories. And these are the shallow leverage points for systemic change. These are the things like, how much money do you pay somebody for not chopping down a tree? <coughs> They're easy to do. Uh, but they don't require fundamental questioning of the system. The deeper leverage points are these leverage points of design. How is the system structured? And questions of intent. What are the values and goals that are embedded within that system? These deeper leverage points are less tangible. Okay. It's not so easy to talk about values and goals and intent embedded within the system as it is to talk about how much money do you place on carbon. And we all actually know that even that's pretty difficult to, to quantify. But these deeper leverage points also constrain and enable the opportunities of these lower leverage points. If we change the conversation about what are we trying to achieve, what do we mean to develop, to to have a good standard of life, then we also change what these lower leverage points look at. If we're no longer saying, okay, to have a good standard of life is measured by GDP, then we're probably no longer talking about material things as being about how much is something worth in money. So we can change all of these leverage points by thinking about the deeper leverage points. As a note, as our project progressed, these two leverage points here, design and intent, sort of morphed in the language of the project to become structures and values. And so that's really the language that I'm going to start using throughout the rest of the presentation. It'll become a bit clearer. We had within the project a range of areas of focus, so uh, perspectives from which we explored these leverage points. And these were really based on our own expertise and areas of interest. So we had restructure, and that was really coming from a governance perspective, where we were looking at the kinds of institutions, policy systems. Um, I've just noticed the typo on the slide, which is very embarrassing for a native English speaker, I'm sorry. <laughs> Pretend you haven't seen it. 
Um, so we were looking at institutional reform, how institutions collapse or change. We also had reconnect. Reconnect was looking at the connections between people as individuals and as societies and their environment. Um, so we really took this to mean ecosystems and our starting point was about both material connections and non-material connections. So the sort of the intrinsic values that we have um, around nature. And we had rethink which was really about the kinds of knowledge, how we produce knowledge, how we use knowledge within the system. Um, and you can see that all of these areas could be related. So for example, um, the kinds of structures that we have in place that dictate how people uh, practice agriculture or how people are able to access nature get out into nature, access nat national parks, for example, can really influence the connections that people have with nature. Also, uh, the kinds of policies that we have, um, the emphasis that's within policies for, say, uh, technocentric fixes to sustainability problems, influences the kind of knowledge that we then need to produce within that system. Um, if we have a system that's really based on economic measures for producing sustainability, then we need to have knowledge that allows us to be able to quantify and understand uh, monetary valuation. Um, so these things are all interrelated, but we split them up into these three areas and tried to find a way to make sure that we considered them in a holistic way. And we did so through two cases. So we grounded our conceptual work. There was always a danger in leverage points that it was going to be very conceptual and, and vague. So we wanted to ground it into two places. So we did a lot of empirical work in Lower Saxony in Germany and in Transylvania in Romania. And we chose these two areas as being really quite contrasting, both in terms of their food systems and their energy systems. So we tried to pin our work into food and energy systems. So in Lower Saxony, we had this real tension between conventional agriculture and really intensive conventional agriculture in much of Lower Saxony and organic agriculture and ongoing conversations around energy transitions, particularly around biomass and wind. Whereas in Transylvania, we were looking at it, it was actually a really biodiverse area with extensive agriculture, but that was increasingly being pushed out um, with land grabbing essentially taking place um, and ongoing conversations about fracking as a power source. So we wanted to tap into these, these kinds of conversations and start to think about how we produce sustainability transformations there. And as an added feature, we also had in each of these two places, we had what we called a transdisciplinary case study within each place where we worked with actors and stakeholders from within the area to really uh, explore research questions with them, co-produce knowledge and also even where a researcher wasn't a transdisciplinary researcher to maybe explore the relevance of the empirical findings that we were coming up with through this project. <coughs> Uh, so we started out as eight faculty members, eight professors, and through the project we recruited five postdocs and ten PhDs. Uh, we officially came to an end this Christmas. The research has ended in September, and we've been tying up and really thinking about the big picture results since. This is much of the team uh, on a little forest walk. Um, this is Dave, who, who co-led with me, and is the graphics person. Um, you can see a range of the things that we did. So these are Romanian pictures. Um, this is my PhD student, Joanna, doing a questionnaire, which I'll talk to you about in a bit. This is uh, a design workshop from Daniela Poikert, who was really thinking about design thinking as ways of uh, thinking through sustainability transformations. And, uh, I've put this picture in because it sort of typifies the area and because a lot of our PhD students spent a significant amount of time in this landscape, getting to know it, getting to understand the people and its challenges. 
and in Lower Saxony. We worked closely with a group of artists um, looking at the way in which art shapes people's connections and experiences with their environment. Um, this picture up here comes from the kitchen mobile. So uh, one of the artists used to take the kitchen mobile to various places and talk through people, their connection, talk through with people, their connections to the landscape through food that was locally sourced and that she would cook it together with people and just explore and have these conversations through that. And this picture here is from Annalie Zeverking's work where she accompanied the setting up of food policy councils in Lower Saxony and really traced that process through with them. Um, and she submitted her thesis in September. Um, so there's some really good publications coming out from that. And Towards the end of the project, so this time last year, we organised a conference uh, where we really brought together researchers from all over the world. We had more than 500 participants coming to talk about leverage points. Um, this is the graphical outcomes from the conference. Um, so we've really been talking about it with the broader scientific community and extending our findings and putting them into greater context. Um, and we've produced in Romania with the stakeholders and the group that we were working with in, in Romania. We produced this book, Balance Brings Beauty. It's also available in Romanian and Hungarian, not just in English, <laughs> um, where we really looked at how do we scale up sustainability initiatives in the area. And we've come up with lots of different case studies in partnership with the, the people that we were working with. <coughs> okay. So that's a bit about the project. Let's have a think about values and structures in leverage points. What do we mean when we talk about values and structures? Through this section, I'm going to show you some of the outcomes from the project and talk to you about the way that we're handling things like values and things like structures. Um, so, all of these slides, I hope, have the link to the, the paper where they're published or going to be published in. Um, this was one of the earliest outputs, published outputs from Leverage Points, where Chris Ives did a review of papers that looked at connections between people and ecosystems. And he highlighted the different types of connections that people have. Um, so, for example, we have material connections, and that leads us into thinking about frameworks like ecosystem services, so the benefits that we derive from ecosystems. But we also have the more sort of philosophical and emotional connections to nature that aren't necessarily based on a tangible outcome that we benefit from, but that are there nonetheless, deeper in our psyche. And so these different types of connections lead us into different frameworks for understanding how we're connected to nature. And a fundamental premise that he was able to explore through this paper was really thinking about how connections shape the values that people have about nature. So, for example, if you are starting to think about material connections and using frameworks like ecosystem services, there can be an emphasis towards, say, monetary valuations and the monetary value that we put on nature. But if we're moving more towards the physical, the uh, philosophical and the emotional, we're talking more about the intrinsic values that people have, the things that they hold important, the, the what they want nature to look like. Developing on such frameworks, we also, uh, so this is Agnes Balassi's work um, from in Romania, where she really took narrative histories with people in the area to understand how they were connected to nature and how that changed over time. Um, I really like this piece of work because she's really taken the time to dive in with people and to understand, okay, what was happening when through history and how did that change the, the opportunities that you had to connect to nature to what you consider nature to be and what that means to you. So 
she looked at connections as being physical, material, experiential, cognitive, and so on. And she looked at the way that these policy structures, as they changed over time, from uh, sort of towards the end of World War II, so pre-socialist, through socialism, and then leaving uh, socialism and moving into the European Union. And the way in which structures, these governance structures, had shaped the opportunities people had to interact with their landscape through things like farm collectivization and the opportunities people had there. And moving into the EU, where then we had this system of subsidies under CAP and who was able to access those. And how did that influence people's agricultural practices and therefore their connections to the landscape? And in particular, this question of smallholder farmers and the values that they have around nature, the, the, their environment that they're based within, and how that was shaped by this changing uh, social and political context. And so she really showed how these histories and this governance structure, so these structural questions, was shaping people's connections and shaping their values around nature. Um, <coughs> this work, I realise I'm giving you a bit of a whistle-stop tour of leverage points here. Um, if you're interested, please do ask questions and we can explore in further depth. Um, this figure comes from a PhD student, Katie Klanicki's work, she did 372 questionnaires throughout Romania looking at people's energy attitudes, uh, attitudes towards the environment, um, <coughs> and attitudes towards sustainability, and their energy behaviours. And so she was really looking at how people's values around sustainability and the environment were shaping their behaviour towards energy use. I guess not so surprisingly, but very importantly, she found that actually people's attitudes and values that they held towards the environment were not what was shaping their energy use. Actually, there were structural issues. For example, policies and incentives and infrastructure, very importantly, that was really shaping their energy use. And so, whereas we talked a lot as a project team about the need to engage with people's values to move towards sustainability transformations, Actually, Katie's work shows that, yeah, you can do all of the engagement with values that you want to do, but if people don't have access to energy choices, then it doesn't matter. And she was really doing these questions, questionnaires in areas where people don't have reliable energy, let alone a choice as to who their supplier is. Um, she went in and was asking questions like, what appliances do you have? Do you have a dishwasher? And people were like... No, <laughs> we do not have dishwashers here. Um, so this was really a, a, a very nice way of thinking about, okay, you, you can have these values and these attitudes, you also need the structure and the infrastructure to allow you to act on your values. Um, but what we did find as well, so this is... A figure in development. Okay, so Joanna, who's produced this figure, and myself, we, we're going to recognise that this figure is a bit problematic, but it's quite nice for demonstrating what we're talking about. Um, but Joanna, who did these questionnaires with Katie, also then followed a policy change process in Romania, where she followed the process of change to a food policy in Romania. And this was supposed to be a radical new food policy in Romania that was supposed to uh, shorten supply chains, increase the amount of local food that supermarkets carried, decrease food waste. It had all these big aims. And as the process went along, these aims all got watered down and it became a bit blur. Okay, nothing substantial has really changed. So Joanna followed this process and followed the actors and understood from them what were their values, what were they bringing into this policy negotiation and decision-making process, and what happened? Why weren't certain values being acted on? Or why were other values being acted on, and how were they winning? Um, and what I really like about this figure, <laughs> for all of its 
problems is that it shows that actually over time, as the policy was going through this decision-making evolution, there were hiccups or points in time at which something happened that allowed actors to jump in and use their values or pull the policy towards their own beliefs and wishes. Um, so they were able to jump in and shift the agenda and take it away from being this radical policy more towards, okay, this isn't in my best interest, so we're going to shift it this way so that it is. And so she was really able to trace this sort of windows of opportunity for actors to intervene to stop this being a transformational policy. Or in some cases to, to increase the, the impact of the policy. <coughs> so Joanna's just working on this paper at the moment where we're going to sort of bring out this idea of windows of opportunity to be able to act on values to shift structures. And so throughout the project we were engaging with this question of values in multiple ways to look at the way in which values can perhaps bring about transformation or not bring about transformation as individuals, as broader society, as decision makers. And Andra, in her paper, um, decided, sort of noticed that there were lots of different ways in which we were engaging with this question of values. And so she decided to look further into this. And she found that actually, if you look across sustainability science, then indeed people are engaging with questions of values in four broad ways. Um, so if they are looking at surfacing implicit values, that's really about trying to understand the values that we as researchers are bringing into a research context. So there's negotiating values, which is like in Andra's uh, figure, in your, sorry, in Joanna's figure, um, where we're looking at the different values that decision makers are bringing in and how they're winning out. So that's another category. We're looking at eliciting values. So that's about understanding the different values that people have um, about a specific object or a specific place. So that would be where we start to bring out monetary or intrinsic values. And we also, there's a category of research where we're looking at transforming through values. So asking how can we engage with people's values to cause transformations. Um, so I think that this is quite an important piece of work that Amber has done under the Leverage Points project to really draw out, okay, how are we, how are we as sustainability science, scientists thinking about values in transformation research? But what's important about this, to me, is that it's all about people's values towards the desirable end state. What does the system need to achieve? I'll tell you why that's important to me in just a second. Because, yeah, I'd like to change direction slightly. I've given you the, the whistle-stop tour of leverage points. Um, now I'm gonna sort of uh, move away from talking as the representative of the project and talk about my research, what I took out of leverage points and where I'm taking it. Um, so prior to and alongside uh, leverage points, I was also working on questions of biodiversity governance in Europe. And one of the questions that we had was to wonder to what extent do existing policy frameworks allow us to perform ecological management in agricultural landscapes. So management that really aligns to principles that we understand from ecology that are best for preserving and restoring biodiversity. And so we looked at the issue of landscape scale management within agricultural areas. Um, we took, really from social ecological systems thinking, we took the idea that actually, for the sake of biodiversity, ecology tells us that it would be best to work on a landscape scale. That allows us to think about landscape heterogeneity, it allows us to think about connectivity of different patches of habitat, 
uh, it allows us uh, to coordinate efforts to make sure that one farmer is not doing one thing and another farmer is doing something that undermines it. So we drew on a sort of idealised motif of what would that look like if we were doing landscape scale management. And we said that two farmers, these two blue Fs, in, a, in an idealised motif, would be working together. Each of those farmers would each be working on their own farm. Okay, so it's those green ecological resources. Those green ecological resources are linked. They just are. That's a physical feature of the landscape. They're, they're next door to each other. Um, so what happens on one affects the other. And so ideally, those two farmers would work together to coordinate the management of what they're doing on their farm with what their neighbour neighbor is doing on their farm so that they can think more landscape scale. And in order to help that happen, you'd have a coordinated act, coordinating actor who would help to, to coordinate and manage and, and think about what management needed to happen. So we took this to various workshops, interviews across Lower Saxony, Saxony and Skåne in Sweden, and we looked at the extent to which this model actually existed in landscapes and the extent to which, for example, the common agricultural policy promoted or disrupted the functioning of this motif. And we found that that motif did not exist. <laughs> Instead, we called it the bucket motif. Individual farmers manage their own farm. They don't talk to each other. They don't influence the management on each other's farm. And importantly, there's no single coordinating actor that can think in a joined up way. Instead, there's lots of different consultants that are employed by individual farmers giving different advice. And we explored the role of CAP in creating that motif. And we found that CAP was, or broader governance uh, systems were largely responsible in three ways. The first being this sort of rollback of government extension services and the privatisation, so allowing consultancies to fill in that gap and compete with each other, meaning that they're competing for farmers, not working together. There's a lot of competition over land ownership and short tenures, particularly in Lower Saxony, which is a barrier for farmers working together. Um, and importantly, although CAP theoretically allows collaboration, and that does happen well in, say, the Netherlands. In the three case study areas we were looking in, there was no, at the time, no official uh, policy incentive for collaborative working together to meet, to get payments under CAP. And that was a big barrier for people collaborating. So we went back to the drawing board and we said, okay, what does a good governance system look like if it's to promote collaboration and landscape scale management. And this is where I'm going to link into leverage points. We said we need a fundamental rethinking of this governance system. What can it look like? So this was really a bit of a thought exercise at first. We came up with four extreme governance scenarios where we said, so at the top line, we said that um, decision-making units could either be territorial, territorially defined, such as they are now, based on the lines on the map that we draw of land ownership. So EU level, country level, federal state level, um, local level, and then individual farms. Or we could go to a different extreme and say that they're defined entirely by ecological units. And so we would be talking about bioregions, we'd be planning according to bioregions and planning according to landscapes within that and possibly sub-landscapes within that. Um, then we could take these two decision-making units and push them to either end of our axis of decentralisation, um, which sounds very fancy but basically means that at one end you would have decision-making units, either territorially defined or ecologically defined, um, which were quite top-down, so based entirely in central government, 
uh, national or the highest level makes all the decisions, sets the goals, tells you how it's going to be, sets the plans. And at the other end of that axis, we're looking at high levels of devolution and decentralisation. So essentially, that would mean that the people on the ground, you and I, the farmers, would get to decide what the targets are and how they achieve them. And instead of it just being government actors, there would be decentralisation to a broader range of civil society, private actors, and so on, that get to make decisions. So based on these two decision-making units and these two extremes, we have four scenarios. The most extreme of which, or the most different from today, was the idea that we would have ecologically defined units for decision making, so bioregions, landscapes, and then within that sub-landscapes, and that it would be highly decentralised. And so the idea behind this would be that basically collectives of farmers within a landscape would come together, work with specialist ecologists and um, civil society actors to define what their biodiversity targets are and how they collectively within a landscape are going to achieve that and how they're going to allocate resources. And so that allows them to make decisions within the landscape on what land gets spared and what land gets shared. Um, perhaps if you have a particularly profitable area, then that gets used for production and another area might get used for biodiversity conservation. But it happens thinking across the landscapes. It's not going to happen, but it was our thought exercise, and we took it back to our farmers and our stakeholders in all of our case study places, and we talked to them about our different scenarios and what they liked and what they didn't like. And I was fully expecting them to tell me that they hated this radical scenario four of landscape scale decentralised um, biodiversity planning, and they didn't. Overwhelmingly, they supported this, this fourth scenario, this radical scenario. And so we probed a bit deeper. Why do they like it? Um, what's, what's important to them about it? And they liked it because of, it made sense from an ecological point of view. They could see that it would be good for biodiversity planning. And they liked that. But what they didn't like was this issue of collaboration between farmers. Um, I even got warned before the workshop in Saxony where we took it back to actors, uh, one of my collaborators looked at me and went, you can't propose communism. Um, <laughs> and it seems, yeah, I can't propose communism. Um, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't, the idea of collaboration wasn't popular. And so this has then, in, in light of the leverage points work as well, I've then taken a step back and said, okay, so we can share values on the end state of the system. What we want the system to look like. We want to conserve biodiversity. We can share those values. But we're not sharing values on how we do that, on how we define that system. Okay. And I think that's important when we come back to, say, Andrew's work of those categories of the way that we're thinking about values. We're always thinking about values around the end point. What do we want to conserve? We're not looking enough at the values about how we do that. <clears throat> Our values around issues like collaboration and what those structures need to look like in order to have a more sustainable system. And so I think that we've got a lot to learn from other areas of research. Um, here I'm actually just flagging a framework from Sabatier's Advocacy Coalition framework, where I won't go into the framework, but I really like his system of three levels of belief. And the way he talks about belief is quite analogous to the way a lot of us talk about values these days. Um, but he really talks about the idea that people have deep core beliefs, and that's the, the beliefs that transcend everything. And to me, those are quite analogous to the idea of these endpoint <coughs> values. What do we really want the system to be? We want to conserve biodiversity. That's our deep core belief. But we also have policy core belief, and that's the how. What are the policy systems that we want? How do we want to work together to reach that end state? 
and we can differ more on those, even if we share the same deep core beliefs. And then his third layer of beliefs, these secondary aspects, are then more about the, and how do you achieve that structure, or how do you work within that structure? So then once you've set that structure, how do you allocate resources and payments and mobilise them? And to me, I don't know about you, how well have you been paying attention to me? This seems to map, I'm actually going to go, I'm going to skip on a little bit. That seems to map really well to these categories of leverage points that we've got. So when I've tried to coordinate the colour schemes here, but when we talk about these values, about the end point of the system that we want to conserve biodiversity, then we're really talking about deep core beliefs. And that's our sort of deepest leverage points. But when we're talking about our policy core beliefs, we're talking about these design issues. What's the design of the structure? And then we can talk about these secondary aspects. What are the material and the processes within it? And so I think that there's something that we need to be working on here can I go back? Yeah. I think that there's something we need to be working on here about lining up these questions of values with this leverage points framework and acknowledging that each depth of leverage point has a, has a set of values associated with it. And I think that we need to also recognise that these other values are probably also shaped by history. So this question, that, or this quote that someone came back to me, you can't mention communism here, or you can't propose communism here, that's a result of the history that people have gone through to get to this point. Um, why can't I propose communism here? Because they've been through that, they know what that means. And they do not have, in many cases, do not have positive associations with things like collectivization. And I propose collaboration, and that's what they hear. So I think similar to how Agnes looked at people's histories of how their endpoint values have come about, their connections to nature, we need to be looking at the histories of how their values about how we work together are created. So that really brings me into my emerging research directions. I want to do that. I want to look at these narrative histories of how people's values about how we achieve these systems how are they created? And I want to really refine those categories of leverage points and values. I've put these two pictures up here because they're really contrasting agricultural landscapes. This is the Czech Republic on the left, and this is Shropshire, where I was born in the UK, on the right. They have very different histories leading to the way that the landscape looks now. The one on the left has communism behind it, um, I'll go into more detail in a funding proposal and future paper for you <laughs> that you can access. Um, the one on the right has a more aggressive neoliberalisation and individualisation of farmers and subsidy schemes. And yet, we seem to be at a very similar place. They've got divergent pathways, but both the farmers and the landowners in both places are a bit resistant to the idea of collaboration. Their pathways have led them. Yeah. So I want to think more about this, elaborate it a little bit, and I think that I'm now going to just round off by coming back to the how, and this is really something that's come out of leverage points. I want to go back into the more researchers' transformation, so really doing this research, engaging with people's values as a way of also exploring how we change them and bring them towards these newer structures that are going to work towards sustainability transformations. And flagging this work, because in doing so, I think we need to recognise that it's difficult <laughs> collaborating as a research team and with people in this transformative research. We found extremely hard through leverage points, even collaborating as a project team of all of these PhDs and postdocs. And we were fortunate enough to have Rebecca Freed in our team who really accompanied that process as a participant observer and understood this process of co-creation within the research team. And a lot of what she's learned and fed back into the project about how we collaborate and the challenges of collaboration um, have really, are really underlying the principles of how I'm now working and designing research projects. 
with a particular focus, a lot of her collaborative challenges and the skills, the skills to counter these challenges are really contingent on having time to do so, to explore people's worldviews, to explore the conflicts with them and to develop trust amongst the project team and the participants. And so when I'm talking about going in and learning about these structural values, I need to really think about conflict and time and trust issues within that. Um, and this is my very final, this is a very undeveloped thing coming out of leverage points. Um, but we had repeated conversations in the Leverage Points project about how we were collaborating with each other and how we were all working together to create these, these transdisciplinary case studies and to generate the knowledge that we were generating. And so this figure is really a towards the end of the project's sort of brain dump about the different roles of people in the project. But what's really important is the bit you can't see on this figure is this line along here which is time. Um, the one thing that we found really important engaging in our transdisciplinary case studies was that time was hugely important. And we managed to get a lot more done in our Romanian case study and to greater impact and greater effect because many of us had a history with working with these people in this place for five, six years previously before we even started Leverage Points. Whereas the Lower Saxony case study was brand new, and much of the time was spent establishing that collaboration, um, rather than actually then developing the knowledge. Whereas in Romania, we'd already established the collaboration, we could start to develop the knowledge. And the reason I'm telling you that is that what I'm currently proposing to do is to explore values around structures, um, and I want to do that in a longer term, living laboratory, invested kind of project, working with people um, in the area to really think about transforming values for the teachers. And so I come back to my initial slide. These are my conclusions. Um, we learn from leverage points about the value of engaging with individuals and their values and the engagement the need to engage with design and structures and the values they embed. And that's why I'm hopeful about Fridays for Future and Extinction Rebellion, because they are engaging with values, they are engaging with individuals and they are starting to engage with systems and the values they embed. But we need to think about values, about how we de design that system. It's not enough to know what we want, we need to know how it's structured to get there. And we need to be having more conversations about that and exploring that. And so that's what I want to do. Yeah.